work. So today we're talking about Chapter 6, Section 3, Struggles in the Middle States. Uh, our central question is, how did the Continental Army overcome hardships to turn the tide of the Revolutionary War in their favor? Now, our key terms for today are the Battle of Long Island, the Battle of Saratoga, the Battle of Trenton, Ally, Cavalry, and finally we will end today talking about Valley Forge. So, as we get, in, get underway, let's start with one of my favorite quotes from history. These are the times that try men's souls by Thomas Paine. All right, now this now uh, this now famous um, quote from Thomas Paine's essay entitled "The Crisis" was published on December twenty third, seventeen seventy six, and it really echoes the sentiment of a lot of the colonists that um, these that this time was very difficult and was very trying. And it, as it says, these are the times that try men's souls. Like it's these difficult times that really test you to test you to see who you are. Um, and what Payne was saying here is he didn't regret declaring independence from Great Britain. Uh, I mean, it was his, his uh, essay, Common Sense, that really was one of the driving forces behind the Declaration of Independence. But he did realize that uh, when you're trying to as accomplish something of this magnitude, it's not going to be easy. Um, what about you? What do you think that this sentence means? Um, what what are some of the things that might happen that would make colonists uh, regret their decision to split away from from uh, England, from, from Great Britain? So think about it. Uh, what would be some of these things that were trying men's souls? Um, so keep that in mind as we as we go through our lesson today. Now. To start, let's look at uh, um, some of the the British battles and the ways that the way that the British took were able to take New York and specifically New York City. Now, Washington had uh, suspected that how uh, the British general Howe was going to attack, so uh, especially specifically attack New York City. So he moved uh, his forces south into the city. Now. General Howe brought a British force that consisted of about 34,000 troops and about 10,000 uh, sailors, so a combined force of about 44,000. And that force landed in Long in Long Island in August against Washington's force of about 20,000, so over twice as many troops and sailors uh, Howe brought versus what uh, Washington had, and. During the Battle of Long Island, over 1,400 Americans were killed, wounded, or captured, uh, which forced Washington to retreat to Manhattan. But uh, as the British pursued, he continued further up north into uh, into New York. Um, and over the next few months, Washington fought a series of battles through New York and down into New Jersey. Uh, and eventually, he was forced over the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. Now, to try and gain information about Howe's army, uh, a young officer named Nathan Hale, an officer from Connecticut, went behind enemy lines to try and uh, gain information and act as a spy. But eventually, he was he was captured, and just before he was hanged for treason, he said the now famous line, "I only regret that I have but one life to." give for my country, or one life to lose for my country. Uh, and this kind of showed the um, showed the, the metal and showed uh, this conviction that many of the uh, Continental soldiers had, that um, Hale was, Hale, he was just a, a young officer, but he said it, his only regret in life was that he would, could only lose his life once for the country in order for the nation to proceed and to go forward. Um, so I think that that's, that's very, very commendable. A very commendable statement. Um, so, for the better part of this war, um, the Continental Army had been fighting on the losing side. Uh, they had a few small victories, but the victories were very they were very small and very 
uh, few and far between. So for the most part, the British army was winning this war. Um, and this, uh, this constant, uh, uh, these constant failures with very few successes were really taking a toll on the soldiers and on the officers. Um, many of them were becoming sick from lack of nourishment, uh, and a lot ended up deserting. So Washington is looking at his, looks at his army and saw a potential early and tragic end to the war. So in late November, he took pretty big risk, risk and decided to attack uh, the city of Trenton, New Jersey. Now, like I remember, Washington had been forced across the Delaware into Pennsylvania at this time, so um, in order to attack Trenton, he's going to have to cross the Del Delaware without the British Army knowing. So he did this on Christmas night, um, and on Christmas night, Washington led his troops across the Delaware River, and this is a very famous uh, painting of what one artist thinks that the crossing of the Delaware looked like. Now, I don't know how accurate this is, considering that Washington is standing up. You can see the large chunks of ice floating in the river that the um, that the men are trying to maneuver around. So, Christmas night, Washington and his troops cross over the Delaware River, then marched through ice and snow towards Trenton, New Jersey. And early in the morning of the 26th, they surprised a company of Hessian troops that were guarding Trenton and took most of them as prisoners. Now, Hessians were soldiers from Germany that had been paid to fight on the side of Great Britain. So basically they were, were kind of kind of like mercenaries. Like they they didn't have an allegiance to Great Britain, but they were other than that, they were being uh paid to fight for them. So it was this group of uh Hessians that Washington was able to surprise when he crossed over the Delaware. Now in response, the British general Cornwallis uh, found out about this and decided to go back into Trenton to try and retake the city and ultimately capture General Washington. So Cornwallis approached Trenton, and what he saw were um, campfires outside of the city that he believed were um, were Washington's troops. So he was looked and said, "All right, well, we've got some time. We'll attack. First thing in the morning, we're going to attack." Um, but if he had only attacked right then, he would have found out that the fires were actually a decoy that Washington has left had left. So he set the set these campfires and set them up to make it look like his army was camping outside of uh, Trenton. When actually, what he did was he took his army, moved around the British lines, and attacked another force on its way into Princeton. So it was with these two victories in New Jersey that Washington was able to instill uh, a sense of hope and uh, well-being in the Continental Army. And which really led us to a turning point in, in the war. Like, as I said, for the most part, up until this point, the Continental Army under George Washington had been on the losing side of this war. Um, but we're going to see how these victories combined with some other events are going to lead to a turning point for for this war and ultimately show uh, the colonials that, hey, maybe we can win this thing. So the British Army and the British government were very upset that their army, which at this time, this was the best army in the world, was unable to defeat these, what they thought was just a group of farmers. Um, so this man, uh, British General John Burgoyne, proposed a plan of victory that involved cutting off New England from the rest of the continent. Now, um, remember, I mean, at this time, the British army was one of the most powerful and most well-trained army militaries in the entire world. So Burgoyne's plan was to, was similar to that that they used in the French and Indian War to cut off Canada from the rest of the um, the the rest of the colonies by cutting off New England. I mean, most of the fighting the fighting had started in New England, and most of the battles had taken place in New England. Um, 
So Burgoyne wanted to try and cut New England off, and divide, and then conquer the rest of the colonies by separating New England from the rest of the continent. So they would first focus all the attention on Massachusetts, uh, New England, um, specifically New York, and then once they were finished there, then they would move into the rest of the colonies. And so his plan called for three different British armies to converge on Albany, New York, um, which was kind of in, it's, Albany is kind of centrally located in New York. Um, but by taking New York, they would be able to disrupt the flow of soldiers and supplies south to Washington's army. Now, to do this, Burgoyne needed uh, General Howe, who was down in the southern southern part, in, in like around New Jersey and uh, Philadelphia, as well as Commander Barry St. Ledger to come down from Canada, and uh, Burgoyne would lead his armies over from New York. So all three armies would converge on Albany. Um, so that was his plan, but... Um, King George III had a different plan. He wanted uh, General Howe to take Philadelphia before focusing on Albany. And since King George the, was the uh, the ultimate, um, what he said, that's that was what he said goes. Um, that's what Howe did. He marched on Philadelphia, and he was able to take the city, but. As, but he was stalled in Philadelphia, and as uh, St. Ledger was making his way down from Canada, um, American forces defeated him at Fort Stanwix, and these American forces were led by Benedict Arnold. Um, and this is the same Be Benedict Arnold who was an American hero, but would soon be uh, one of the most vile names in all of American history. So... Um, so his plan called for three armies. Um, Howe was able to take Philadelphia, but was stalled there. Um, St. Ledger was defeated on his way at Fort Stanwix, so that just left uh, General Burgoyne. So he was left to take Albany all by himself. But as he was moving towards Albany, he moved very slowly through the woods due to heavy equipment and a really lack of good solid roads uh, but despite the slow move Burgoyne was able to move in and recapture Fort Ticonderoga which initially had been captured from the British by uh, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys so this is a couple of years later um, Burgoyne moves in and is able to capture Fort, Ticon Fort Ticonderoga and then he split his forces and sent some of his soldiers up into Vermont to get supplies uh, and on the way, his the, that set of soldiers was attacked, um, with nearly a thousand of them wounded or captured at the Battle of Bennington. So he was already working with one army out of three. He splits his forces. Some of his forces are defeated, so he's working with a much smaller group of soldiers than initially he had planned for. So he so Burgoyne moved from Saratoga or moved from uh, Ticonderoga down into Saratoga, which is about 20, 30 miles outside of Albany. Um, and it was here that Burgoyne was surrounded and eventually forced to surrender. And it was this American victory at the Battle of Saratoga that was a major turning point in the war for three reasons. Um, first, it ended this British threat in New England. Um, the whole Burgoyne's whole plan had centered around Albany, but wasn't even able to make it to Albany. So, this so by being defeated at Saratoga, it ended the British threat in New England. Um, so that was one of the effects. The second was that it, I mean, this was a huge victory for the Americans. So this really boosted their spirits and the morale. But the third and probably one of the most important uh, effects is that it convinced France to become become our ally. Now, the Continental Congress had been hoping and and uh, levying for aid from France and had even sent Benjamin Franklin over as a diplomat to try and 
persuade the French king, uh, Louis XVI, to give weapons and supplies to America. Now, France was kind of was eager to get another chance to try and defeat Great Britain. I mean, remember these are historic enemies, so uh, they see like, oh, Great Britain's in a in another war, so they're looking for an opportunity, a chance to defeat them, but. They were hesitant to help the Americans unless they believed that an American victory was actually a possibility. So um, take a step back, put yourself in France's shoes for a second. Um, I'm, I'm a French general. I just fought a war against the British in these same colonies just a few decades earlier, and many of the people that I would be fighting with, or fighting alongside, I had fought against not not that long ago. Um, so I'm being asked to team up with these same colonists that I just fought like a few decades before. Um, so is it worth it to potentially lose another war against Great Britain in the same area that we had just previously lost a war? So they, like, yes, they wanted a chance to defeat Great Britain, but say, there's a good possibility that it wouldn't it wouldn't end for them well this time either so they're like what do i do what do i do questions 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 so but with this battle with the victory in the battle of saratoga that proved to france that uh the colonists really could win this war so in february of 1778 france became the first nation to sign a treaty with the united states now it recognized uh, this new nation as a nation and not as British colonies that we that were rebelling. They actually recognized us as a free, independent nation and agreed to provide military aid to this new nation. Um, but even before this, before France officially became our first, first full ally, um, th there were some individuals and volunteers that had come over from Europe to provide aid and provide some know-how. And among these was uh, this man, the Marquis de Lafayette, who had trained many colonial soldiers and ultimately became one of Washington's closest and most trusted friends. And um, you can see his name throughout the throughout the country um, as a tr as many uh, people have paid tribute to, to the Marquis de Lafayette. And actually, the county that I was born in and raised in Fayette County is named after this man, the Marquis de Lafayette. So he was very influential. And like I said, he was, he be, ultimately became one of Washington's closest and most trusted friends and allies. So we have from France, uh, Lafayette from the German state of Prussia came Baron Friedrich von Steuben to train Washington's troops in how to march and to drill like an actual army. So they took this group of farmers and hunters and uh, trained them to become an actual, an actual army. And there were two Polish officers that came over to help tr build forts and to train a cavalry, which are troops on horseback. So, so you have, so we now have France as an ally, but we also have these other, um, uh, allies from from different parts of Europe that came over and volunteered to help uh, the Continental Army. Which brings us to one of the biggest turning points of the war, which is the winter that was spent at Valley Forge. Now, these re recent victories in New Jersey and York um, and the promise of aid from Europe uh, really helped to boost uh, morale of the, the Americans, but uh, during the winter of 1777 to 78, uh, the Continental Army suffered one of its hardest times at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. This was not a battle against the British Army. This was a battle against uh, Mother Nature. Now, the conditions here were horrible, and this was, like I said, this was a very long and cold winter. And many of the soldiers slept either in cold huts, if they were able to get into a hut, or outside on the frozen ground. Um, and many of the soldiers stood guard wearing blankets or and or without shoes. So this is a horrible time to go without shoes. Uh, at this point, the Continental Army had been fighting for a couple of years, and supplies were 
supplies were very low and had, had uh, dwindled. And I want you to take stop us for a second and take a look at this this painting that was done of George Washington at Valley Forge. And what is what about this painting uh, can you grasp about Washington's relationship with his troops? Um, as we we look at the painting, we can see. Uh, it's just him on a horse, so it's meant to show that he's he's lonely. He's carrying the weight of his army on his shoulders. His head is drooped. He's low in the saddle, and you can tell that he's uh, the artist wanted to show how much of uh, how much of all of these uh, hardships he was carrying on himself. So, as news spread about the difficult situation going on in Valley Forge. Uh, patriots from around the nation sent food, clothing, blankets, and ammunition to try and support them, try to support their soldiers. Uh, women in Philadelphia took up collections of clothing, shoes, um, blankets, and brought them out to Valley Forge for the soldiers. Valley Forge is not that far from Philadelphia. so um, And it was with the arrival of these supplies, and soon after that, uh, with the arrival of warmer wet weather, um, Washington didn't know it at this point, but uh, the Continental Army's toughest times had just passed them. Um, it was the victories in New York, New Jersey, and then ultimately being able to survive the winter at the long winter at Valley Forge. That was kind of the turning point of the hardest times for the Continental Army were then were then behind them. Um, and it's as we're going to see in the next couple of session, sections, how coming out of this winter is going to lead the Continental Army into ultimately what would be uh, victory over the British, over the, at the time, the largest and most powerful army in the world. Um, so, which brings us to the assignment for today. Now, there's no written assignment, but I want you to go back and review sections one, two, and three um, for the upcoming quiz, and I want you to focus specifically on the key terms, the battles, and different geographic areas. And with the battles, I want you to kind of hone in on where the battles took place geographically and what the outcome of those battles was for the British and for the Continental Army. And with that, I bid you a fond farewell. I hope you enjoy going back and reading through the lesson, especially checking out the videos, because uh, they'll add a little bit more, um, more depth to...